Take your Bible. Where are we going to go? Let's go to... Is that it? No, we're beyond that. Turn to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. We're looking at the various offices of the Lord Jesus Christ. Who can name some that we've already touched on so far? High priest? Come on, there's a test coming. Remember what the Bible said? Study to show thyself approved unto God. What are some of the offices Jesus holds? Prophet. He's the head prophet. Huh? He's a counselor. We don't have that in here, I don't think, but he's a counselor. He's a, he is the wonderful counselor. What else? We got high priest, we got prophet, angel of the Lord. Rock. Huh? Rock. The rock. Uh, I don't think the rock is an office, Steve. <laughs> but, you know, maybe there's no wrong answers. High priest, high priest. See, man, we was on that for a while, weren't we? The chief bishop, the prophet, the angel of the Lord. The, the apostle, the apostle, the high priest, who said judge? All righty. So Hebrews, uh, listen, where did I tell you to go? Acts chapter 10, verse 38. The Bible says, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and shewed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. Think about that. When Jesus rose from the dead, what body did he have at that time? Huh? Okay. You could, I guess you could see it that way. Yeah? Did it still have nail holes in it? Was there still a wound in his side? So would it be fair to say that the body that Jesus went to the grave in is the one that he came out of the grave with? He looks the same. He's got the wounds in his hands and his feet. They pierced his hands and feet. He's got the wound in his side. I think probably right here the, the, and pierced that pericardium. Okay? So he, he comes out of the tomb with the same body as the one he went into. Okay? But he can do neat stuff, like disappear, okay? So anyway, and there's, a, there's I think, a neat teaching behind that. Because we know at some point, Christ then is glorified, okay? And he has this glorified, wonderful body. I have a theory. And that theory is, I don't think he has that body yet. Huh? Why wouldn't he? Why wouldn't he? You might want to take a guess what's in my mind. We are the body of his second coming. Okay? We are that body. On that day, I believe that we're going to be, we're going to get rid of this flesh, and we literally, and I can't explain how it's going to look, and what's going to, how it's going to be and all that. I cannot do that. <coughs> what I can tell you is the body that went into the tomb was the same one that came out of the tomb. He had holes in his feet and his hands, had a wound in his side. Okay? And according to the Shroud of Turin, he had, no, I won't touch that. I don't believe that was Jesus, by the way. Okay? But anyway, why was I saying that? Anyway, we're witnesses. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly. 
Uh, not to all the people, but in the witnesses chosen for God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. The point is, he ate and drank after he rose from the dead, like he did before he rose from the dead. Okay? Uh, and he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead. Now, what does that phrase mean? And it doesn't mean the slow guy who couldn't draw his weapon as fast. Okay? That's Clint Eastwood. What does quick and dead mean? He's the judge of the quick and dead. The living and the dead. He is the judge over everybody and over everything. And we live in such a, a depraved, hell-deserving world right now where everybody wants to just pile on their sins. They want to express their sins openly. They're like uh, the people of Sodom. They have no shame. They do not hide their sin. They're out of, out of the open. And, you know, in my lifetime, I've seen a transition. In my lifetime, when I was a little boy, and I first heard the word gay. And I, didn't, I asked my mom what it meant. Of course, she didn't want to tell me. Okay? But what does it mean, this guy's gay? And what, what's happened is, in my lifetime, sodomites, who were, oh, we're afraid to come out because we're going to lose everything. We're going to lose our jobs. We're going to lose this. We're going to lose that. I can't come out and open. Now when they come out, we name a street in their honor, build a shrine to them as these wonderfully brave, exceptional people who are sodomites, disgust, disgusting people, filthy, nasty, dirty. Many of them are pedophiles. Don't you fall into that nonsense that, oh, they're just decent people. They just love, them. don't believe it. They're very, very corrupt. Very corrupt in their perversion. Okay? And so, the quick, in Christ, we live in such a world today, nobody wants to be judged of anything. And, you know, again, you've got the Hollywood crowd. You've got the liberal Democrats in Washington, D.C., and Jefferson City, and Hillsborough that want to uh, reward these people for being brave, for coming out in the open, for coming out with their sins and their degradation. And anybody who expresses a negative opinion about someone being a sodomite, well, you're judging. You're not supposed to judge people. Well, well who are you? Uh, you think you're better than everybody else. Who are you to say that that's wrong? And we've gone from a nation that at one time, even though they weren't saved, they knew the difference between right and wrong. They were afraid to call good evil and afraid to call evil good. But it's not that way anymore. Hollywood has led to that. The television industry has led to that. The music scene has led to that. It has, it has uh, uh, in, ingrained in the minds of young people from all the way back in the 50s, the most depraved kind of sin, violence, immoral acts, and it used to be they hid it in poetic language in the songs. They don't do that anymore. I can, you would blush to hear some of the rap music, hip hop music, and the lyrics that they sing openly to your children, which they ought not listen to that. You should not, do not allow your children to listen to that garbage. Okay? The corruption of, Paul was right, evil communications corrupt what? Good manners. Good manners. The things that you want to instill in, the, in the things that you want the Word of God to instill in their life, music, movies, television, you name it, and their teacher at school is going to twist their minds around Make little socialist robots out of them. Immoral socialist robots. You do what the state, the government tells you to do. You fall under exactly how the government is going to shape and mold your life. And that's not America. Not the America that started. Okay? But this world, whether they want to be or not, is going to be judged. And since they don't want us judging them, they say, God is our judge. Fine. Let's let God judge them. Listen. Mr. and Mrs. Sodomite, trust me, you'd be better off us judging you. 
Because we don't have the keys to hell. But the judge, the judge, has the keys. Let me ask you a question. What kind of political, governmental system did Israel live under while they were in the wilderness? Does anybody know? What kind of political, governmental system ruled over Israel? Theocracy. Huh? Theocracy. Um, I'm, Steve, I'm, the, only way, the only reason why I would say I'm not sure is because I'm not sure. I'm not sure of the definition of the word theocracy. I mean, I know what it means. Theos is God, and the crazy on the part of the crazy part on the end of it is how they rule, a type of governmental system. So, in essence, yes, God did rule, but I think there are different ideas behind a theocracy rather than what Israel actually had. They did. I couldn't say that they had a true theocracy because there was an earthly part that ruled over them. Okay? Does anybody know what it was? You're not going to believe how simple this is. It was the judges. They did not have a king. They did not have a prime minister. They did not have a president. They did not have a governor. They did not have a mayor. They did not have a, a city council. They didn't have a congress. All they had was a judge. And before Jethro came to Moses, there was only one judge, and that was Moses. So Moses then, he sat, when they weren't traveling, Moses sat in a judgment seat from sunup to sundown, hearing everybody's grievance, one against another. Hearing even crimes that had been committed from one person to another person. And he had to rule on these things. And Jethro's father-in-law came to him and said, Moses, what you're doing is not right. Okay? What you need to do is you need to set up a system where there are people under you that are going to judge according to God's law. And they're going to judge the smaller matters. But if the matter be too great for them, then they're to bring it to you. Moses then was the supreme court. The chief justice, as it were. And his judgment seat was reserved only for cases that were too difficult for the lower judges to decide on. May, or maybe the lower judge made a decision and then somebody didn't like it and they had a right to appeal and they appealed to Moses to see what his idea of it was. But it wasn't difficult because God gave them a written law. Moses wrote down, and I'm going to ask a question, and the rules and laws that God gave to Moses, do you think God left anything out of it? I don't think so for a minute. I don't think God would just say, oh, uh, wasn't planning on that. I don't know what to do here. Okay? God gave the law to Moses. Moses wrote it down. And when Moses judged, he was not to judge on the basis of his own feelings, his own intuition. What is the difference between intuition and critical thinking? Intuition makes decisions based upon emotions or feelings. Critical thinking makes decisions based upon what's right, what's good, what's wrong, what's bad. That's how it makes its decision. And while here you have a commandment given down by God, thou shalt not commit... I did this. I talked about this today in a pure Bible study. You have a commandment that says thou shalt not commit adultery. But then you have people who say... But I felt in my heart that it was the right thing to do. And I actually had, I, I worked with a guy one time when we were out of Sullivan. And I'll never forget what he did. He came to me and he knew I was pastoring a church. And he said, I'm going to run something by you. This guy told me, he admitted to me, him and his wife, and he had like three or four children. They were going to this church. He was having an affair with a piano player. And he said, you know, me and my wife, we fight all the time. He said, I really don't think God intended for us to be together. I think God wanted me with this other woman. He was making his decisions based upon his emotions. And I told him. It was what he's wanting. He's wanting somebody to say, you know what, you're probably right. Why don't you divorce that old gal and leave her and marry this other guy. Or this other gal. And that's, that's what he was shooting for. But I told him, I said, let me tell you something. God said, that's not committed adultery. It does not matter what position you hold in the church. 
It does not matter what you think. It does not matter what you feel. If God said don't do this, he meant don't do this. It's not a great issue. It's black or white. Do I have to stand here and define for you what adultery is? No. I may not be able to define every single act that defines adultery, but we know it when we hear about it. Amen? Okay? These men were to rule based upon the written law that God gave them and make judicial decisions. Not in what they thought was best for the community, not in what they thought was best for somebody else, and they were not to ever fear the faces of men. Because you might have had the, uh, maybe some from, from dad, and they were known as the big old boys, the rough boys. And boy, they were tough. You don't want to go up against them, and they're all stuck together like family. Well, let's say that one of their brothers has a court case before Moses. Moses looking at them big old rascals, knowing that they don't mind punching somebody or threatening somebody with violence. Moses has to look and say, if the witnesses say this man did it, he's guilty as charged, and the punishment's death. And he had to execute it. Ask yourself the question, did Israel have a jail or a prison? Why not? Why did not Israel have a jail or a prison? The punishment was already written down in the law. What they were supposed to do for whatever offense it was. And if it was found by the mouth of two witnesses that the crime had been established, there's no waiting around. When he's judged as guilty and the sentence of death is upon him, they executed that that day. If they were going to give him 40 lashes, they gave him 40 lashes right then. But as far as punishment for crimes, he was either the lash, monetary repayment, or death. But no prison. You know why I think that is? God knows that for the most part, most people are not, what do they call them, correction centers? Most people are not corrected by jail or prison. Now, even if a man said that he was sorry for what he did, and he deserved the punishment, that did not allow Moses to withdraw the punishment from him. Even if he confessed and admitted he's wrong, he's still guilty and the sentence should be executed, but he's right before God. Okay, so no harm, no foul, right? So anyway, it was the judge system. So, uh, verse 42 again, he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believed in him shall receive remission of sins. Now, I like this, how it's packaged together. Brother George, you were admitting some things in my office. I was quite shocked. So George admitted that he was a rotten, low-down, scumbag, hell-deserving, wicked sinner that needed to be saved by God. Shocked me. Okay? And in this package here, you understand that when God looks at your life and he writes down the things that you are guilty of, you're guilty of. And God has judged you as being guilty of of those sins, the execution of the judgment is to take place now. Except you confessed, you repented to God, and God gave you forgiveness of your sins, laying those sins on Christ on the cross, even though it was 2,000 years before that. You believe God can do that? Sure he can. Took those sins that was against us, nailing them to his cross. And God took your sins, laid them on Christ, and he's crucified. And by the way, the Bible says he's slain before the foundation of the world. So his salvation extends throughout the whole history of man. Even though you've been judged as guilty by God. And if you don't want men judging you, that's fine. But God's going to judge you. God's going to judge you. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12, turn there. Hebrews chapter 12. Verse 22. Hurry, 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 hurry. But ye are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly of the, and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all. Look at it. To God the judge of all. God judges over every nation. 
every race, every family, every kind. Red and yellow, black and white. Okay? God judges over everybody. And God's judgment is always righteous. Amen? To God the judge of all and to the spirits of just men made perfect. And to Jesus mediator the new covenant. So we have a judge. I want you to picture now a courtroom. Here is God the judge. You are the accused. And in God's courtroom there is an accuser of the brethren. Who is that? Satan. Listen to me. Satan is not going to allow you to get out of God's courtroom without naming every sin that, you, that he talked you into. He talked you into them and he's going, yep, they did it. Look here, Lord. Look what your servant's doing. That's what he does. He accuses the brethren. So we have the accuser of the brethren against us. Who else is against us in this courtroom? Who is testifying against Ryan, thank you, Ryan, for volunteering. It's all right. Your conscience, what does that mean, sir? That's what the Bible says. Your conscience is going to excuse or accuse you. Your conscience, con means with, science means knowledge. Your conscience is what you know about your own deeds. So while you try to tell a lie and say, no, I didn't do this, your conscience knows you did. And your brain has to do all kinds of funny things to get you to focus on saying that you didn't do it. And some people can read that. But just think about it. They're going to call Satan, and Satan's going to say, look here, I've got a list of 412 offenses that I personally talked him into, and he did every one of them. And here they are. Here's, here's the accusations against him. We have any witnesses? They're going to call in your conscience. It's going to show your conscience the list of 412 transgressions that you did last week. You've been busy. You've been busy. And your conscience is going to say, the, the judge is going to ask you, conscience, see this? Did he do those things? Conscience says, I was there for every one of them. I knew he did. While the devil was writing them down, I was too. Into a memory that, for the most part, will never be wiped away. Who remembers the things you've done? To this day you do. Okay? What if they brought your mother and father in to testify? You know what mother and father would say? I was a sinner. Mom's a sinner. We made a sinner. He did it. When you say that, Mom? Brian did it, didn't he? You didn't know what it is. No, he knows he did. So they call conscience in. Call your parents in. Call Adam in. Adam says, he's my son. I know he's guilty. He's guilty as charged. He did those things. Okay? What you need then is an advocate. You need a defense attorney. The best one. Okay? You need the, very, you need the dream team of O.J. Simpson <laughs> to get you out of these charges. Okay? You've got one better than that. Okay? Jesus Christ is the advocate with the Father. I like these judicial terms in the Bible. That just, well, it gets me. Because God put his law in force and it operates like a machine to this day. No, flawlessly. So the advocate is either going to say about you, Ryan, Judge, Your Honor, my Father, yes. He has admitted to every one of these transgressions. But he's confessed them to me. And Father, you, you knew this because 2,000 years ago you laid all 412 of these on me. When I went to the cross, I took those offenses to the cross and I nailed them to the cross and they died when I died. They're dead. Amen. Amen. You got an advocate with the Father. Amen? Whoop! So anyway, well, I like this. Now, I'm going to run through some psalms. Okay? I like the psalms. When I'm looking for definitions, I go to psalms every time. Let me try to run through some of these very quickly to understand about God and His judgment system. 
Psalm 50, verse 6. The heavens shall declare His righteousness, for God is judge Himself. You know what that means? What do you think that means? God is judge Himself. What does that mean? There is no other judge. What you hit God, He's the most high judge. There is not an authority that is above Him. And if God says it's this way, it is this way. That's it. That's the end of the road. Okay? God is judge Himself. By the way, who judges God? Nobody. Nobody. God is incapable of being wrong. God is incapable of lying. God is incapable of making a mistake in His own courtroom. God is incapable of breaking His own law. So the sacrifice of Christ on the cross was not God throwing out His law because He felt like it. It is because Christ fulfilled the just demands under the law, paying the penalty, which was death, Christ died. Now, the judgment is over with, it has been executed, now there remaineth no more condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. No double jeopardy. You cannot be reaccused of the same sins that you were forgiven of. Now there's wolves out there everywhere. The Mormon church, Finnis Dates Doctrine declares this. They both say that if you confess the sin and God forgives it, but then go out later and commit the same sin over again, God then unforgives the previous sin and loads both of them back on top of you. That is a disgrace. When God casts them as far as east is from the west, how far are they? They're still going, by the way. They're still going. Uh, Psalm 96, 13. Before the Lord, uh, for He cometh, for he cometh to judge the earth, he shall judge the world with righteousness and the people with his what? The very Bible. Brother George, that the preachers and the churches are casting away is the book that they're going to have to stand before and give an account of. I'm going to give an account before God. I mean this is dead serious. I'm going to give an account before God of the things that I've done and said in the ministry. And I'm not looking forward to that. Because even though I have... I thought that something fell over here. Even though I have an advocate with the Father, even though I know I have the blood applied, I know the transgressions have been washed, but there are just some things I'd just rather stay buried. Amen? But we must give an account before God. When David was given a choice, David transgressed. God told him not to number Israel, so what did he do? He numbered Israel. And God gave him a choice. God, God told David, he said, I'm going to give you a choice. He said, number one, I can let you be into the hands of men, and men can judge you. Or, God said, I will judge you. Which will it be? David's wife. David said, I'll let God judge me. Men, I don't trust them. I know men. Men do not have mercy. God has mercy. I will appeal to that judge. But he's going to judge us with his truth. The Bible, the word of God. And again, reason 6,908 why I do not believe there's one mistake in my Bible. This is the law book. This is the book that God is going to operate by. And if God's going to accuse you of something, it has to be written down in the book as being wrong. You can't do something, God not like it, and then later on write another commandment just because you did this and God didn't like it. And make you guilty after the fact. Okay? It doesn't work that way. He's going to judge this world with His Word, with His truth. That, in, that includes Christ, by the way. Psalm 98, 9, before the Lord... Uh, did I read that already? Okay, Psalm 98, 9, before the Lord, for He comes to judge the earth, with righteousness shall He judge the world and the people with what? What's that word? Equity. Remember, God hates a false balance. When God judges you, He's going to do it, and you're going to be on equal terms. Everything has got to come out equal. So, the common man says, I will just tell God all my good deeds, and I'm going to put them on this side of the scale over here. 
So that hopefully, when God puts my sins over on the other side, hopefully, my good deeds will still have outweighed my bad deeds. Here's the problem. According to Ezekiel 33, let's say, Jr. let's say that, uh, let's say that you've, you've been in class all week, you've done all your goals, you've scored correctly, turned in all your work, you tested out absolutely perfect, got a hundred on four tests this week, okay? Best week of your life, okay? And then you make one mistake. Would it be fair to say that you need to be punished for making that mistake, even though the rest of the week you've been really good, right? Would it be okay to say, well, let's don't punish him. I mean, he was good all week except for this one thing. In God's courtroom, according to Ezekiel 33, let's say that you were righteous all week and you were good didn't lie, didn't cheat, didn't steal, didn't chew no tobacco, didn't do anything like that. Didn't puff your putt. I'm just making that up. You didn't do any of that stuff. Went to prayer meeting, went to church. I mean, you're a great. And you committed one sin. According to Ezekiel 33, all of your righteousness at that one sin is gone. So, here's your righteousness, your good deeds you pile on the scale. And you commit one transgression and you put it on the scale. God then removes your righteousness because you have violated his word. If a man sin one time, what's James say? He's guilty of all. The man who the law in one point, he's guilty of all. So we're not just going to take one sin and put it on the scale. We're going to put the entire weight of God's law down on that scale. Meanwhile, all your righteousness is done away with because you sinned and broke God's commandments. That's how God sees it. The only, and there is no way in the world you're ever going to be able to do enough righteous deeds to counterbalance that one wicked deed you've done. So what has to happen is, God has to make you as righteous with equity. All of your sin, every one of your sins and transgressions, God, completely. It's the only way you're going to find that equity, because that's how God judges you. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay? If you get pulled over and the cop writes you a ticket, it's 150 bucks. You can tell the cop, look, I've been doing good all week. <laughs> this is the first time I've drove past, you know, 40 miles an hour anywhere. I've never broken the speed limit, but he got you. And he's going to write you a ticket for 150 bucks. Did you know that officer does not care? Does not care how good you've been all week. And if that's the first time you've done that, he does not care. You were in a school zone. You were running through little kids diving in the ditch, getting away from you. You transgressed the law. You're guilty. Period. Who's got to pay the fine? You do. Let me give you a couple more verses. I'm going to let you go. Psalm 67, 4. Oh, let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For thou shalt judge the people righteously and govern the nations upon the earth. Psalm 75, 7. God is the judge. He put us down one, set us up another. Amen. Let me tell you something. God always knows which president to put in office. God monitors the whole nation. And he knows, okay, we're going to do it this way for eight years. What is the, if you were to, would you think that Obama and Donald Trump are pretty much the same as far as political candidates are concerned? No. They're as far as east is from the west. But God put down one and lifted up another. Why? He's the judge. God always knows more about the state of our nation than you or anybody else knows. And God knows exactly who to put in charge. Amen? Last one, Psalm 82, 1. God standeth in the congregation of the mighty, and he judgeth among the gods. Little g. Who's that? When he, he judges among the gods. The devils. God's going to judge every devil that he created. Is he going to judge Satan? <clears throat> you bet. He's going to bind him with a chain put him in the bottom of the spit for a thousand years. He's going to let him out. Satan's going to go right back into gathering an army. And then God's going to throw him all in the lake of fire. But God's going to judge every one of them. And God's going to judge 
the devils that have been rocking your boat all week long. Amen. Do you ever, I don't know, I never think about that. But those devils that have been hounding you all your life, God is going to take every one of them and give them a just judgment. And he's going to cast them into the lake of fire. And with Satan himself, you know what the Bible says he's going to do with Satan himself? God is going to judge Satan and bruise him under our feet. The sentence is, we're going to stomp him. Stand your feet. That didn't hurt too bad. Uh... I was going to give you every place in the Bible where the word judge, judges, judgment, judging, 700 some odd verses. But I decided to cut it down a little bit. And I'm not done. There's some neat understandings. And I, want to, I just want, I want to encourage you, study the word judge, judging, judging, different things like that. You know what you're going to see? You're going to see in the Bible, you're going to understand God's judicial character. And if God says that something has to be this way, I'm going to tell you something. God knows it. God specifically would not allow Paul to go preach to Asia. He did not go to those China, Japan, Korea. Do you ever wonder why? Yeah. Me too. Paul wanted to go. And God said, no, he turned him toward Southern Europe. Those people today are still just as lost as they ever have been. And more than likely, God knows something about those people that he knows they are never going to accept the gospel. On the most part, they're never going to do it. So God sent Paul to the people that he knew would accept the gospel. Now, some can say that's racist, some say that's unfair, but let me tell you something. God knows them. God knows them because He made them. And He knows what they will and will not do. You believe that? Why did He call Judas? Why did Jesus call Judas? He knew exactly what He was going to do. And that's why He called Him to do that. You believe that? That's God's sovereignty. He's the judge, alright? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God bless you tonight.